next in. Uh, hi, I am Wes Nunley, Director of Business Development here at Next Level, and this is Next In. Today I have on Dio Famakinwa from uh, Data Site. Sorry, I, I had a had an awkward hiccup there. <laughs> Um, from data site. Uh, and so we're just going to talk today about growth. Um, Dio is a vice president of product in his current capacity. And we're just going to talk about how you get to that level, um, things you can do if uh, you're listening to this and maybe you're that product manager who's at that kind of senior level. Um, that's that's where we're going to take this conversation today. And so I'd love for you to kind of give us your background and just kind of tell us what you're doing today. And then we'll just kind of flow right into it. Sure. So my background, oh, I started my career um, back in 2004. And when I started my career, I worked at uh, Microsoft as a consultant. And luckily for me, unlike a lot of other people who just stumbled into product management, I was lucky enough to work for a team that was building a product there at Microsoft Dynamics. And, you know, I had a really good mentor that taught me some of the fundamentals of product management. So that was my start. After leaving uh, Microsoft, I spent a number of years working for um, customers across the Midwest, Fortune 500 companies, spending time solving very difficult problems for those customers. So between my um, job at Microsoft and the consulting roles I had, it all served as a very good foundation for learning the ins and outs of product management along the way. Nice. So that that mentor early on, would you say that having that was kind of instrumental to laying a foundation to get to where you are today? I mean, is that fair? That is fair. Uh, absolutely. Uh, product management is one of those careers where even though now I'm seeing some universities that have programs around product management, it is still traditionally very difficult to get into. In fact, most people I know that do product management today, they stumbled into it along the way from a different career and ending up in product management. Yeah. So, so for you, how did you make that leap from like consulting to, to being full on uh, product manager? Sure. So I talked about Microsoft. I talked about my consulting roles along the way. As I became a senior consultant, a lot of the work that I was doing um, for clients and customers across the Midwest here, it ended up being started to turn into product management work where I'm working with customers. I'm helping them define strategy. And then we are talking about how we can solve um, those problems for the customers. Now, at the time, this was in the early 2000s, we didn't call it product management, the work I was doing, but it's really what it, it, it was. So um, the first very most influential book that I read around product management is a book called Inspired, an older version of Inspired. It's a book by a gentleman called Marty Kagan. And I really view um, his take on product management and how he advocates that we do it as um, very instrumental in into the product manager I am today. That's awesome. That's awesome. So that first, I, I guess that first real like, hard, I guess hardcore product manager role would that have been the Optimizely when you started back in like fourteen? Would you consider that? Yes. The first? Yes. Correct. So um, my first um, stint as a product manager, where the actual title was that. Uh, it used to be called Insight Software. They got acquired by Optimize Lead. Yeah. Um, Insight Software is a company that builds a platform for e-commerce. So as a small manufacturer or medium-sized distributor, you can use that platform to build an online e-commerce presence. So that was my first time doing product management there. I spent a lot of time with them um, building out a new platform for that company, um, a platform that you could use to spin up e-commerce sites for manufacturers and distributors. Nice. That's awesome. So what was the biggest, I guess, problem that you were trying to solve uh, when you joined them? So the biggest problem we we're trying to solve there was that, you know, they had a platform that manufacturers could use to build an e-commerce site. But the problem with the platform was it wasn't very configurable, right? So we were working through how to build a platform that allowed um, us to very quickly make design tweaks to those sites to meet um, the customer's needs. So how do you build a platform that uses less development to customize and more configuration to get what a customer is really trying to look for? Nice, very cool. And then uh, obviously it only progressed from there. So like when you look back now over, you know, a, a, essentially a decade, 
Mm -hmm. uh, at, at, in product management, you've obviously handled mm -hmm. multiple problems and solved multiple problems for, for clients and customers. Um, what product do you look back, whether it's data site or Optimizely, um, what product do you look back on and you think, man, that's the one I'm most proud of? Like it's that one right there. I, I would say it's the one that data site and it's that for a number of different reasons. First, uh, when I joined data site in 2016, you know, it was a company that was going through transformation. This is a company that has been over 50 years old. They hadn't launched new product in a very long time. So in coming in here, um, I was part of a team that was brought in and the first thing I worked on was a brand new platform here at Datasite. For those who don't know, Datasite, formerly known as Merrill, is a company that builds solutions and tools for deal makers. So if you're involved in an M&A or mergers and acquisitions transaction, we build products that people selling companies can use, but also products that people that are buying companies can use as well. So building that platform, brand new platform from scratch and doing it as part of a transformation of the company at large yeah. um, is one of the biggest achievements that I have. Yeah, I think, and uh, you know, if, if I'm reading everything properly from DataSite's own website, mm -hmm. that, that mergers and acquisitions product is the primary product. I mean, would that be? Yes, yes, correct. Yeah, yeah. so, so it's cool. a primary product that we have. It makes hundreds of millions of dollars in the marketplace yeah. today since we've launched it. And yeah, it's been very successful so far. That's awesome. I'll be honest with you. I've never made anyone hundreds of millions of dollars. So, <laughs> <laughs> so well, I'll tell you this right now, though. The uh, CEO of my agency would be very happy if I, if I did make us $100 million. I, I don't doubt it, Wes. Yeah. I, don't doubt it. <laughs> I would also be very happy. Um, no, that's Absolutely. awesome, man. So, Dow, I would love to, if, if you could, from your seat now, pretend you were talking to your past self, you know, mm -hmm. five, eh, let's say seven years ago. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give to, to yourself then? I, I think the advice I would give is, um, you know, take risks. Um, I'm a firm believer that, you know, if you go and try something that's new, something that you haven't done before, um, you may fail. But I don't view that failure as failure in the traditional sense. I view it as if you go do something new, it's not successful based on what you call success. You probably still learn a lot along the way. So out of that failure or learning, right. you become a better person on the other side. So you have to, the chances of you achieving what you want um, would be zero if you never tried, right? So, so just maybe take a bit more risks along the way is what I would tell myself. Yeah. You know, I, I, so that's, that's one of my go-to questions when I'm talking to, to directors and VPs. Mm -hmm. And that is a common theme, like be willing to take risk, be willing to, to try and to fail because, mm -hmm. you know, I think if you never get out of your comfort zone, like it's not even possible to grow. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So that, I mean, that's, that's a, that's an awesome growth mindset. And, and then in the book, so kind of tying those things together, um, you know, taking on risk, growing, kind of being mm -hmm. a lifelong learner and having a growth mindset. Mm -hmm. Like in the book inspired, like how is how is that that book specifically like flowed into you as a product manager and how you and how you operate? Sure. So I think the biggest takeaway from the book, well, there, there are quite a few, but I'll talk about the biggest ones that I want to cover here. The biggest one is if you look at the way software development has been done in the past, it used to be a process where you know there's a whole waterfall process where you define a vision on top without input from, usually without input from people on the ground that are really seeing what customers need. And then you define that vision and then you go through this whole really lengthy process where you, you, you define it, you build it, you test it. Only then you give it to customers that only to find out most of the time that you've missed the mark on what customers want, right? But when you look at that book and a lot of the practices that um, the author of this book, Marty Kagan, you know, really evangelizes, it's really around taking the time and trying to, one, spend as much time with your customer as possible. In fact, I would say the only difference between a project manager and a product manager is that we are making, you're making a bet in your organization that if you have people, product managers, that spend as much time with the customer as possible and understanding their problems, you will have better outcomes. So, so that's the first takeaway. The second takeaway is that it advocates for a process of building new functionality and software where you can build design with the customer, you can build with the customer, you can test very early 
And yeah. as you're testing along the way, you are ensuring that you are building things that the customers find useful and you're de-risking the whole launch process along the way. Yeah. Now, what? So in, in that in that kind of flow of, of actually building something that the customer finds useful and the customer wants, mm -hmm. what has been an effective method for you to translate what customers want with what engineers have to go then build, right? So sure. translating that customer desire to, what? hey, this is what they want. Let's make it happen, yeah. right? Yeah. Have you seen the meme? There's a a meme that's floated around. It was like with, with the with the tires on the swings. Yes, <laughs> customer <laughs> expectation, and then the. So how, how have you how have you overcame that? Because that that's sure, a typical sure. problem, right, in, in cross organizations. Yes. Absolutely. So a couple of things. Um, when we go to talk customers, uh, when I have my people go to customers and talk to them, it's usually something that I very, very strongly believe that it shouldn't be just a product manager that goes alone to have those conversations. I say customer manager should be there. Your UX designer should be in that conversation. And your developer should be in that conversation too. Having those three individuals in that conversation does a very magical thing, which is everybody's hearing the same thing. Everybody's hearing the same problem. You don't end up in this scenario where the product manager goes there, learns from the customer, and then brings back stone tablets that the team needs to absorb. Right? right. right? So, so, yeah. so that's number one. <laughs> and, then, and then number two, once you have that, um, we are here at Datasite, we use what we call high fidelity prototypes. We use a tool called Figma, among many, yeah. to really build out prototypes that will look like the exact thing we're trying to build. And so, and and you can also, you can also work through the experience that a customer will have through those prototypes too. So we go there, we talk to customers. You show them those live prototypes. They can simulate how it will look, how it will work. And then those prototypes, once we get to a good place with the customer, become the foundation for what the developers work off of. Right. No, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, I like the idea of like you're, you're sending one of your product managers to talk to a customer and the mm -hmm. developer sitting right there with them. Because Absolutely. I've heard I've heard tons of developers say, well, a product manager brought us this, but that's not possible. <laughs> we can't uh, do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah. so it takes the product manager out of a, conversation where they don't understand the problem and you're and they become mercenaries instead of missionaries when it comes to development. We like to say as you're cultivating your team, you want a team of missionaries and not mercenaries. You want people that are thinking about the problem the same way the product manager is. Yeah. And you want that because a lot of those good ideas about how to solve the problem, a lot of them can come from the user experience designer. They can come from the developer too. If you just have the product manager being the one that has the conversation, then you close off this creativity that can exist within the team where they have alternate solutions. Nice. That, that's awesome. That's awesome. So when, when you look at, at kind of your, so we looked in the past, like when you kind of looked at your, like your future self and product, like now, where do you want to be in five or 10 years? Like, what do you want to <laughs> be doing? Um, solving difficult problems for customers. Um, working with a team of very talented people that I care about and I care about their growth and progression. Um, you know, so it's things like that that come to mind to me. So as I think about roles and where I work and what I do, you know, if I get to a point where one, we are not solving difficult problems for customers, or I'm not working with people that are very talented or people I can coach into being, you know, better at what they do, then maybe it's, it's time not to be where, where, where you are anymore. Right. That's good. So, you know, we, we've kind of hinted around this because you talked about p people to coach, problems to solve. When mm -hmm. it comes to coaching and mentoring younger yeah. product managers, what's kind of your philosophy mm -hmm. there? Like, how do you how do you approach that? So how I approach it really depends on the background the person is coming from. And I will explain some of the best product managers I've seen have been one people that come from other industries, but just have yeah. a very, you know, curious uh, mindset that they bring to how they, you know, look at things, right? And some of the other ones, some of the best people that make good product managers are people in your customer service department or your um, support department too. And I say that because those folks, they have a lot of conversations with customers over time. Same thing I've right. been preaching since we started a conversation. But at the same time, they're also people that have grown to know and love your product as well. So they know what customers like and don't like, and then they know your product as well. Now, the last leg of this tool you need to teach them 
is you know how to be a good product manager. So 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 back to your question though, I would say if the person is new or if it's someone in the organization, you would bring them in as a, I would say using an associate product manager program, and in that program you not only teach them the fundamentals of product management and delivering products. Those are two things you teach them. But the other part of it is you pair them with a senior uh, product manager that has managed people before, so they can shadow they, they can shadow those people and learn some of the intricacies of what we do. Yeah, nice. So have you? So I'm assuming with that, you, you, have you taken people who have kind of had that customer experience and, and maybe have the intangibles, but have never uh, actually been in product and uh, absolutely, absolutely. I I love my uh, I love my rogue people that end up in product management from other places. Um, I have a lady on my team, for example, uh, I'll give her you her name, Zoe. Um, when Zoe and I first started, it was Zoe approaching me and saying, you know, I have ideas about how we can improve the product. I want to be a product manager, but she hadn't done it before. And, you know, she made that transition from being a support manager into being a product manager. And now she's been uh, very successful on the team. That's and awesome. even most recently has really has launched a brand new product for us. That's awesome. Dude, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, one of the things I enjoy most about kind of what we do is um, because of who our CEO is and because mm -hmm. of our CEO's background, mm -hmm. we really have the ability to take someone who has never been in any kind of executive level or technical recruitment. Mm -hmm. And if they have the personality for it, and, yeah. and honestly, honestly, the joy of talking to people, yes. we can teach them everything else. Absolutely. Right? And so yep. it sounds like product management is kind of similar to that. Do you do you find kind of so so taking someone like Zoe or mm -hmm. someone who has those intangibles but has never been in mm -hmm. product management mm -hmm. is the hardest part or the hardest thing to teach them, like how to translate those um, requests and desires into something that's actionable for engineers? Would that be kind of the. No, I, I would say the toughest part would be, um, you know, we, we pro it's it's well. That's one of them that you called out, how to translate it from, you know, what they're thinking to the developers. That's one part that's hard. The right. second part is you really need to, to be successful at product management. You need to be very data focused. And by that, I mean, you know, you have hypothesis that you come up with of what customers, you know, you think they will, they will use and what you can solve. But then going out there, having those conversations with customers and then backing your conversations with data too. Um, I just, you know, being someone that's very data focused and uses data to make decisions is a muscle that you have to to build to be successful at product management, too. Nice. Very cool. I love that. I love hearing stories about people that are willing to invest in folks where they see potential. But maybe maybe you don't have the resume, because I would imagine if someone like Zoe had put out a resume mm -hmm. To get a product manager position, it probably would have never happened. It, it, it probably would have never happened. It, yeah. It's it's quite unfortunate that, um, and we're we're diverting. But resumes are, if you look at resume on paper, a lot of times it's what we have today that tells you someone's history and how they came to be. But a lot of times you need to have conversations with people to really yeah. understand what they're capable of outside of the resume. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the whole world I live in, right? One of the things I one of the things I say to people, you know, when and when I'm when I'm recruiting or, or doing any kind of search is like, hey, I see your LinkedIn. Like this isn't a living, breathing document. Like this is just text absolutely. on a screen. Like I, I want to know you. I want to know who you are. Absolutely. Um, yeah, man, that's incredible. So look, I, I want to be really respectful of your time. You know, we try mm -hmm. to keep it kind of in that half hour window so people mm -hmm. will actually listen and not tune out at, you know, I think the average intention span is like. 40 minutes or something like that. Absolutely. For me, it's yep. like, it's like 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> but, but for, for, for normal functioning adults, I think it's a little higher. Um, so man, what, what would you say, uh, you know, pre presumably there's going to be people that aren't even at that senior product manager level yet that just kind of broke mm -hmm. into it. And mm -hmm. a lot of times I talk to people who broke into product management kind of middle of their career. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, it's cool. I'm here now, but it's like, I'm behind. Mm -hmm. Age-wise, for other product managers my age are, what, mm -hmm. what would you what would you say to that person to like encourage them to kind of press on and and grow? Sure, sure. I would say um, first, um, find a good mentor in product management that you can work with and someone that can take you under their wing to help grow you. Is the first one. I would say the second one is um, you know, just in product management, you need to be a lifelong learner. So. Keep learning, um, find good podcasts, good sources of content for continuing education for product management. 
I will say if you are in your organization, um, invest in being very articulate because that is very, very helpful, whether it's talking to stakeholders, talking to customers, or even kind of articulating what you're trying to do within uh, the organization to leadership. And then uh, I would say the last one on there too is, you know, like I said earlier, take risks, look for, look for projects that are risky, maybe nobody else wants to take, yeah. and then, you know, really execute and, and be successful at those projects because it gives you good visibility within your organization. Yeah, so find a mentor, yep. invest, in, invest in continuous learning, right? Yep. And then mm -hmm. take risks. Absolutely, take that's, risks, that's a, yes. I think that's a good yes. recipe. Yep. Um, you know, I like to always kind of get specific anytime somebody says, you know, podcasts or books. Are there any podcasts out there you would recommend that, that maybe have even helped you as a product manager? Absolutely. Um, there is one on leadership. It's called The Look and Sound of Leadership. It's by a guy called Tom Henschel. Um, his podcast episodes are very short. They're a okay. few minutes. And it covers a bevy of different topics around leadership. It's right, very, yeah. very good. Yep. And then books, I've already talked about Inspired. There's a newer version of it. It's by a gentleman called Marty Kagan. Um, he has another book called Empowered. It's a book that teaches you actually how to be a product leader. So Inspired is for aspiring product managers. Empowered is for uh, people that are looking to get into product leadership there. And then the last book I will give is a book called uh, Continuous Discovery Habits. Okay, nice. Continuous Discovery Habits. That sounds very relevant to being a product manager. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> That's great. I'm literally thinking about uh, a friend who I spoke with just yesterday who's mm -hmm. just very hungry to grow as a product mm -hmm. manager and is just consuming anything and everything. And so I wrote those down because as soon as we're done here, I'm literally going to turn around and text and be like, you need to go get Absolutely. inspired. You need to get empowered. <laughs> All of that. That, All sounds of that, like, yes. that sounds like the beginnings of a motivational speech. Yep. right? And then the last thing I would say is for people trying to get in, um, you know, you, so two, two points I want to make. The first one is if you're in your organization, you're not in product management yet. There are product managers there. Talk to a product manager there. Ask them if you can write as a fly on the wall as they do their work. So think of it as free job shadowing you can do there. Make sure your boss is okay with you spending that time that way. Because I think you can learn a lot about product management in, in that regard. And then I will also say that uh, for a lot of those Fortune 500 companies, software companies, they have associate product management programs you can get into as well. And some of them are really, really good. Yeah, that, that's awesome. That's awesome. So man, we'll we'll leave it there. I think that's really good advice. And um, yep. Dio, I've enjoyed it, man. Same here, Wes. Thanks yeah. for the time. I appreciate it. Absolutely. We'll be in touch. I'll talk soon. Same here. All right. Bye. Next day.